Morning, everyone. Welcome to worship here at Peace. I'm Pastor Andy. Get to be the pastor here. It's good to be able to join you this morning here in person, and also uh, hello to those of you tuning in online uh, for worship today. Uh, it's going to warm up a little bit this week, so thank God for that. But then we're supposedly going to have like two inches or two feet of snow. I don't know if you guys have been following that. Uh, I'm praying for the two inches. Uh, but uh, be, be prepared for that later on this week. But it's good to be with you, especially if you're newer here this morning. It's good to be able to worship with you and get to know you a little bit here at peace. A couple announcements before we kick off worship this morning. Um, in the, the bulletins that you have that, that you should have gotten when you came in, there's a list in there of a number of different small groups that, that meet throughout the week, throughout the month, in a, a variety of different forms. Um, we encourage you to, to consider joining one of those or, or dropping in and getting to know a little bit more about those groups. And if you have questions, you can reach out to us at the church office. Uh, we believe that's one of the great ways that you can grow in your faith, but also get to know other people here at Peace. So if you've been here at Peace and you're like, hey, I want to get to know a little more people, uh, joining one of these groups is a great opportunity uh, to do that. And so those are listed there. And if you're like, hey, I, I think there's uh, you know, one that you could add, uh, you might be the perfect person that I can work with and kind of help uh, get a new group started. So let me know if you have an interest in that as well. Uh, so I encourage you to consider that uh, for, for you and your family. And then the next announcement is actually come from me. I'm going to invite um, my better half, Katie, my wife. Um, she is on the women's team here at Peace that helps plan women's events. And she's going to share with us um, about the women's retreat coming up in April um, and the deadline that is coming up in just a couple of weeks. But Katie's going to share a little bit about um, that women's retreat and why women, you all should go. So Katie, <laughs> take it away. Um, well, hello. I am extremely ecstatic to be here because I was supposed to make this announcement two weeks ago and then our family got COVID and then um, it snowed really badly last week and I wasn't going to drive here. So here I am this week. I'm so happy to be here and make this announcement. The Women's Retreat is coming up. Um, it is April 23rd to the 24th, which is a Saturday in the morning through a Sunday in the morning. It's not a massive time commitment. I know that might feel like hard to rip yourselves away from your family for a day and a half, but I please encourage you to consider coming and doing this thing for yourself so that you can be, have more energy and be able to be there in um, a more like, I guess, present way for your family after you do this retreat. So like I said, it is April 23rd to the 24th. We are exploring our unique giftedness. So we'll take um, an assessment to find kind of our strengths and then also some of our weaknesses. We have an incredible, amazing woman coming. Her name is Lynn Corker. She'll be speaking and um, working with us on that giftedness. Um, she is the founder of an organization called Women of the Pearl. It is an organization that helps women in Africa um, provide for their families um, and uh, in, in, equips them to be able to do that. So she's an incredible woman. Um, you'll learn more about her there, but she'll be leading us um, through kind of the ways that God encourages us to use our giftedness. So we'll be working on that. We'll be learning a lot about ourselves and each other. But then also it's a time where we get to have relaxed, laid back activities. Um, we get to spend time together and it's the women from the eight o'clock service, from this service, from the six o'clock service. So it's a great way to connect with all of the women of the church because we'll be all together in this um, hotel. It's called the Bay Point Inn in Shelbyville. So it's a couple of hours away. Um, uh, we uh, will be in a room called the fireside room, so it'll be nice and cozy. I don't know if it's going to be warm or cold. It's April, so God only knows at this point. Um, but we will be nice and cozy. We'll be together. Um, the registration fee covers our stay. It covers all of the food. It covers all of the activities. It covers our speaker. Um, it's $175 per person. Um, when you fill out your registration and turn it in by April 15th, so that is coming up. Or, I'm sorry. February 15th, that is coming up. I know what month it is. Um, when you turn that in, there'll be a $75 deposit that we expect with that. With all of that being said, if you want to go, I want you there. So if $175 seems like a, like a financial burden to you, please come talk to me privately. I would keep that conversation private and we would find a sponsor for you. That would also be private. Um, they wouldn't know who you are. I don't care if, well, that sounds terrible. I don't care if you don't have the money. I just, I want you to be there, regardless of whether, um, of whether or not we're able to, um, $175 would be a financial burden. I'm just mumble, um, 
I've been here for a long time today, so I'm so excited about this. It'll be a great opportunity. Lynn is an amazing woman, and I just look forward to getting to know all of you better. I know a lot of you a little bit, and I'd like to know a lot of you a whole lot. So I look forward to that time together. I look forward to this trip. Um, I look forward to, you know, 25 or so hours where he's in charge of my child and I just get to be with you guys. Um, and I, I just really look forward to it. So I hope you'll consider coming. I hope you'll consider doing this thing for yourself. And I don't think I left anything out in all my mumblings. I think I got it. Okay. Well, please come to me if you have any questions. I'm bouncing now, but if you need my contact info, Ellen has it. You have my permission to get my contact info. So. Yep. All right. Thanks, Katie. Yep. You can reach out to the church office if you want to get in touch with Katie if you don't already have her information. One last thing we get to do this morning. Uh, I'm looking for Daniel. Where you at, man? There you are. Come on up. So we have uh, a new uh, Concordia student field worker. Um, we here at Peace, we've done this now for for a couple years now, and so if you've been around, you might be familiar with this process. Um, Concordia Ann Arbor, um, just a little bit east of us, they train uh, church workers to go into our denomination, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and we get to partner with them and have some of the students come uh, and work with us for a semester, learn from us, and we get to learn from you as well. Um, and so our, our newest uh, student field worker is uh, Daniel Jacob. Um, so he'll be doing stuff with our young kids on Sunday morning, with our confirmands in the evening, and also our high schoolers at, e at the evening as well. So if you are in those spheres, uh, I'm sure you'll be seeing Daniel around for the next handful of months. He'll be with us uh, through May when he graduates, and then you'll get to find out where you'll get to serve on kind of a full-time internship after that. And then you also have plans um, of going to seminary after that as well to, to train to be a pastor as well. Um, so we'll definitely uh, be encouraging you in that. So with that being said, we now get to install him and welcome him to our church family here at Peace. So family and friends of Peace, Daniel Jacob, has been assigned to Peace as our ministry student worker for this semester. As a student assigned to our church, he will continue his education and preparation for service to the church as a called worker. Um, so basically it means he's got double duty. He'll be doing all of his classwork and homework. Uh, as well as getting assignments for me and me putting him to work a little bit too. So you get uh, the benefits of both. Like I mentioned, he'll be helping with youth, confirmation, and kids ministry. So Daniel, I ask you, are you prepared to serve as ministry student worker here in this congregation, undertaking your assignments as one who seeks training for service in the church? If so, then answer, I am with the help of God. Now, Daniel, I install you as ministry student worker at peace in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Hold on, you can't go just yet, man. <laughs> Let's pray. Oh God, through the grace of your Holy Spirit, you pour the gifts of love into the hearts of your faithful people. Grant health both of mind and body to your servant Daniel, who now begins his term of service as our ministry student worker at peace. May you enable him to love you with his whole heart and with his whole strength, and to perform those things that are pleasing to you. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you, Daniel. Now you can go. Let's give him a welcome to our church family here at Peace. Awesome. A lot of fun stuff this morning. So with that being said, we'll now begin our worship service. I invite you to please rise as you're able. And we'll begin our service now by calling upon the name of our God, whom we've come to worship. And so we begin this service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show. 
invite you to join me in a time of prayer. Dear gracious creator, Lord, your son came to this earth, showed his power and authority in all that he did, casting out demons, setting people free who were afflicted by sin and disease, cast out the forces of darkness, both open and hidden in our world. Lord, we ask today, through the power of your Son and your Holy Spirit, that you may give courage and faith, peace and relief to all of your people throughout the world, to us here gathered today, and to all especially who suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. May you hold all of us as your beloved children in your care and comfort. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our mighty and resurrected Savior. Amen. We continue now in worship by uh, confessing our need for forgiveness, uh, by calling to mind the things in our, our week, uh, our month, things that are, are burdening us, that we can come and confess before the Lord and ask for his forgiveness. I invite you to bow your heads with me in a time of confession. Dear good and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today as, as people who have been made in your image, who have been, been given your law, your word of, of what is right and good in this world. But we also come to you as people who recognize how often uh, we break that law, how often we fall short of what you call us to do uh, in bringing uh, your love and your mercy and your justice into our community, and into our, our everyday lives. Lord, for all these things, for all this uh, the sin in our lives, the sin that, that burdens us, the sin that entraps us, the sin that we seem to not be able to escape, Lord, we, we lay that before you this morning. We, we, we put it before you and, and, and ask that you would, for the sake of Jesus Christ, forgive us and show us mercy. Well, friends, I invite you to lift up your, your eyes. Uh, the, the great thing about, about Jesus is that when he came into this world, he entered in and took on all of our suffering, all of our sin, everything you and I have done or ever will do. He took that upon himself so that we would never have to face the punishment, the judgment for that. And because of his death on the cross, he has forgiven you of all of your sins, those you have committed and those you will commit in the future. Every single one of them has been nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. And so because of that, I announce to you this morning that all of your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you all to please be seated as we continue with our scripture reading. The scripture reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water, of life without payment. This is the word of the Lord. This time we have an opportunity for any children that would like to come forward for a children's message. You're invited to come and sit up front here with me. 
All right. Got a couple. Do we got another one coming? No? All right. Well, good morning, guys. Good to see you guys. Oh, we got one more coming. Good morning. Rocking the, rocking the sunglasses. Love it. So if I can ask you guys, I want to ask you about some of your favorite things. All right? Do you think you can think of that? What are some of your favorite things? Like, what's your favorite food? Ice cream? That's a great food. What about you guys? What's that? You have random ones? Well, what's, your ran- what's one random one? What's your favorite food that you like right now? Pizza? That's great. What if- Do you like donuts? I like donuts, too. Those are really, really yummy. Ice cream, pizza, donuts, that's a great meal. Let's go out and let's get that, all right? We got, we got, we got the main meal covered and we got some dessert options. It's going to be great. So what are some of the favorite things you like to do? So that's favorite food. What are some of the favorite things you like to do? Like maybe it's an activity, maybe it's a sport, maybe it's being with a certain person. What's your favorite thing to do? Yeah, so you love the monkey bars, and you're ready to try the big ones, too. That's great. So monkey bars, you love doing that? What about you, Caden? Um, I love playing with my friends at school. Great. You love playing with your friends at school? Do you have a favorite thing you like to do? Mm-hmm. Playing with your dog? Dogs are the best, aren't they? Yeah, these are all great things that we love to do. Now, you're probably wondering, like, why, why is Pastor asking me what's my favorite food? What's my favorite thing to do? The reason I'm asking you about your favorite things, and I'm sure you have a bunch of other favorites, uh, the reason I'm asking you is that, that when we read and we heard from Revelation chapter 21, that was the scripture reading we just heard, we heard that, that one day Jesus is going to come back. And when he comes back, he's going he's to make everything the best it can possibly be. So what that means is this. I imagine that when Jesus comes back, you're going to be able to eat all the ice cream you want to eat. Does that sound pretty good? That sounds really good, doesn't it? You're going to get to eat all the pizza you want to eat. You're going to get to climb on all the monkey bars to your heart's desire. We're going to get to do all of our favorite things, but it's going to be the best version of it. Do you guys want to be a part of that? Do you guys want to experience that? Like, do you want that to happen? That sounds pretty cool, right? But Jesus says when he comes back, everything that we love about this world, everything that is our favorite thing, It's going to be even better because that's what he will bring into this new world that he's going to make. So here's two things that we can do because Jesus promises, I'm going to do that. I'm going to bring it. So what can we do as we wait for Jesus to come back? I think we can do two things. One, when we get to do our favorite thing, when we get to eat our pizza or play with our friends or uh, eat donuts and play on monkey bars or eat ice cream and we get to play with our dog, when we get to do those things right now, we can give thanks to God for all of these awesome things right now. Do you guys know that you can thank God wherever you are? Like, whatever you're doing, you can say, like, hey, thank you, God. You can do it in whatever you're doing. And so I think one thing we can do is thank God for all of the great things he gives to us right now. But the other thing we can do is we can share some of those things right now. So when we wait for that day when Jesus returns and makes everything the best it can be, we can thank him, but also right now, we can share those great things with other people. So when we're hanging out with friends or playing with our dog or or at school playing with other people, we can share some of these great things we have and we can tell them, hey, Jesus is coming back and he's going to bring all of this great stuff too and it's going to be even better. Does that sound pretty cool? Let's go ahead and let's pray to Jesus. Let's thank Jesus for all that he gives to us. Let's bow our heads, hold our hands. Dear Jesus, we thank you for all that you give to us, all the the great things of our life that you give to us, the food, the stuff we get to do, the family and friends that we have. We thank you for all of those things. As we wait for when when you return and you come back to be with us and you make all those great things even better, May we share those things. May we look for people who 
who maybe are going through a hard time and share with them some of the good things you've given to us and share with them the love that you give to us and that you have for them. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus and all God's children said, amen. Well, thank you guys for coming on up. You can head back. We have kids ministry going on right now. We have our teachers waiting at the back of the church. So kindergarten through fifth graders, you can head on back. Parents, be sure to pick them up at the end of the service. That's it for uh, the children's message. We will now continue with our next song. now in a time of a prayer over our offerings that we give back to the Lord out of what he has first uh, given to us. There's three ways you can give your offering here at Peace to the, the work that the Lord is doing. We have a basket in the back for physical offerings. You may mail it into the church during the middle of the week, or you may give online through our website. Whichever way you choose to give, we thank you for your generosity and commitment. Uh, let us now join together as we pray our offering prayer as one. Everything we have is a gift from God. All that we have and are belong to God, bought with the blood of Jesus. Lord, help us to be a people who live lives of sacrificial generosity, that through our generosity, your love would be known. Keep us from the delusion of wealth and riches, and remind us that our treasure is in Christ. Increase our generosity so that there are no needy persons among us. Grant us faithfulness in our stewardship 
of such a small thing as money that Christ may trust us with true riches. Above all, let us be generous because our Father is generous and it is our joy to share his generous heart with the world. Amen. As we continue in worship, we invite you to take a, a moment or two and fill out the fellowship pad, which is those uh, maroon booklets in the ends of your row or on your table. Uh, if you can fill that out, let us know where you're here with us in worship, and be sure to pass that down to other people as well as we sing our next song. Come and behold Him, see His glory, come with an honest heart to see all He is, we will discover all of His beauty, His light will Just as a mirror shows our reflection, His Word and Spirit come now reflecting His love. Come and be. morning again to all of you. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, today we are uh, actually wrapping up this series through the book of Revelation that we've been in, believe it or not, since like right around Thanksgiving. So we've been in this for, for a few months now. Uh, I've been greatly uh, appreciative to be able to dive into the book of Revelation at kind of a deeper level, and I pray it's been a blessing uh, to those of you who have been able to, to follow along. Uh, even though we've just been skimming the surface, there's so much more to the book than even what we've covered in these couple months, but, but I know I've greatly appreciated it. Uh, as we wrap it up with Revelation 21, um, it's fitting that at the end of the book of Revelation, what it primarily talks about is the end, <laughs> about what happens uh, when Christ returns. Uh, because if you've been with us through Revelation, you understand that, that the parts we've been reading through and, and kind of the confusing parts of Revelation, they're telling about this, this cycle and this pattern of, of human sin and, and judgment of God, but it tells the story over and over again in multiple different ways and in multiple different forms. But that's the bulk of Revelation is not something about what's coming in the future, but actually what's going on now. But at the end of Revelation, it, it is specifically focused on what is coming in the future. What is coming when Christ returns and he makes all things new? Because that's fundamentally the promise that, that Christ gives and that Revelation 21 tells us, is that when Jesus returns and he is going to return, everything will be made new. 
In other words, what he says is this, that we will have a new home. Now, I say that, and here's what I know about myself, and I'm willing to bet about you too. When you get something new, whether it be something big like a new home, uh, or a new car, or a new technology toy, or, or whatever it is, there's this incredible feeling when you get it, this newness that you get, right? It's like that new car smell. Everybody knows it. How long does that last, though? Maybe until your first time you get at McDonald's through a drive through or whatever. Uh, but how long does that, like, figurative new car smell stick around? I know when you, you get a new home, and I was a first-time home buyer when we moved here um, to the Ann Arbor area uh, about a year and a half ago, it doesn't last too long when you start realizing all the projects you've got to do. That newness fades away real fast, and you start seeing all the bills that are associated with it. Like, oh man, maybe this newness isn't all that great. But there's something about that new thing that you get, whether it's big or small, is it's incredible at first, but eventually the newness fades. The newness goes away. The newness breaks down. Here's the incredible thing about what Jesus promises when he returns and he makes all things new. It's like we're always going to be in that new car smell. It's like we're always going to be in that experience of newness and it's never going to end. Like, it's hard to wrap your mind around it, but that's what he promises, is that when he makes things new, when he returns and gives us this new home, it's not going to fade. It's not going to grow weary. It's not going to give out. It will be perfect forever, and there's nothing else like it. And that's what Revelation 21 wants us to grab a hold of today, that this new world is coming. And so as we think about this chapter, this end to Revelation, um, what we have are two longings and one command. That's what we're going to go through this morning. Two longings and one command. Uh, the first longing is, is the longing of every single human being. The longing of every single human heart. What do you long for? You may have never put it into words, but I can guarantee you this, you long for something, or, or multiple things even. Like, what's the thing, if you were to drill down and think about in your heart and your mind, that, that you would pray to God and see, say, God, God, if you fix this, if I got that, or if that was removed, whatever it is, then I'd be good, then I'd be at peace, then I'd have comfort and joy. What's the thing you long for? What is that for you? See, Revelation 21, I think, unearths for every single human being, we all ultimately long after the same thing, whether we realize it or not. We ultimately long for a new home. When you drill down and think about all of our longings, that at the base of everything and we, was that we long for a new home. See, Revelation 21, John is using words that, that he didn't necessarily come up with. He's actually using words that come from hundreds of years before him from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, who was a prophet of God, who was like John, given a vision of when God returns and makes all things new. Listen to what Isaiah said some 700 plus years before John wrote his letter. It says this in the book of Isaiah chapter 65. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and for her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping, the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work 
of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain. What Isaiah is describing is exactly what John is describing. They're just talking to two different sets of people. John is talking to, to early Christians facing persecution and suffering, and ultimately they're, he's speaking to us. But Isaiah was speaking some 700 years before that to, to God's people who were living in exile, to, to people of God who had been given a land, who had been given the promised land, and screwed it up because they turned away from God. And so God, because he's God, he can take away what he gives. But he was doing that so that they would turn back to him and trust in him. And so there they are in exile on a foreign land as refugees crying out, we just want to go home. And Isaiah says these words to them. They're longing to go back to Israel and to build their houses and to do their life like they had been. And then Isaiah says this, Yes, God is giving you a new home. And he paints this great picture of what it's going to be like when God returns and makes all things new. And I imagine the people of Israel are thinking to themselves, you kind of overshot the target. <laughs> we would have been fine just going home, going back to Israel. That's what I imagine they were thinking. And I think that's significant because I think what it tells us is this, that the longings that the people of Israel had, the longings that the people during John's day have, the longings that you and I have, ultimately won't satisfy. And God knows it. That whatever longing you have, maybe it's like you get a job you actually don't hate. And you don't want to wake up and go to that day in and day out. Or maybe it's a relationship in your life that, that has been on the, the fritz, that has been strained, and you want it to be fixed. Or maybe it's your health, and you're like, I long for my body to not, like, kill me. You long for those things, and those are good things to long for, and to pray for, and to seek God after. But here's what we need to remember. Even if you get those things, the longing will still be there. Because what you and I long for is so much greater than what we think. What we ultimately long for is a new home. For what, what John tells us and Isaiah tells us, when Christ returns and makes all things new, that is when the longings of every human heart will be satisfied, will be met and accomplished. And if you're like, I don't know that I'm, I'm buying that, Pastor Andy, I got two quotes for you. One from Jim Carrey. You guys know Jim Carrey, right? Great actor. The Mask is still one of my favorite movies. Jim Carrey says this. said this a couple years ago in an interview. He said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Good wisdom in that. Some decades earlier, a guy by the name of C.S. Lewis, who Christian author, wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, among other books, he said this, our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a vacation at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Here's what I know. When Jim Carrey and C.S. Lewis are saying like the same thing, that what we long for isn't going to satisfy, I think they're right. When you get these two guys who couldn't be more opposite each other, are tapping their finger on the same problem. 
Our longings for the things of this world will ultimately not satisfy. But the good news that Revelation shows us is this, is that God knows it and he's bringing this new world in. That's the whole point, is God promises that he has begun to to bring this new home into our lives through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that he's begun to bring that, and we see glimpses of it now, but he promises that there's a day coming when everything will be made new, and that all of the longings that we, we struggle with and that we have in our hearts, they will be put to rest, and they will be met with the incredible joy of having our new home. I mentioned there was a second longing, though. It's not just the longing of the human heart. It's the longing of God, which is kind of a weird thing to think about, that God would have longings, but he does. And if you read through the scriptures and if you read in Revelation 21, you see this, that God's longing, his ultimate aim is to be with his people. Revelation 21, verse 3, it said this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Now, if the, the whole Revelation 21 talks, has kind of reference to Isaiah, you may be hearing this verse and if you grew up in church, you may be like, hey, That's from the book of Leviticus, and if that's you, let me know, because good job. But that is a direct quote from the book of Leviticus. From a time when God's people were wandering in the wilderness, going from being rescued from Egypt and slavery and waiting to go to the promised land, and God gives them this promise that I'm going to be with you, and he he promises to do that through a tent. He's like, I want you guys to build a tent And there's going to be smoke and fire, and I'm going to be with you in that. But then when they eventually get to the promised land, he says, I want you now to build a temple, and I will be with you in that. And so they have this tabernacle and this temple with the presence of God. But again, they they messed all the things up. And they turned away from God again and again, and so he led them off into exile. But before they went into exile from the land, they had an exile of his presence. Because they said, nah, we're good without you, God. You, you, you saved us from, from, ins- from being enslaved in Egypt. You've given us this incredible miracle of, of this new land, and you promised to be with us and give us blessing, but we're good. We're going to do our own thing now. They turned away from the presence of God over and over again. But they eventually went back to the land. But the end of the Old Testament has this question Will the presence of God ever return? Because the people realized they had messed up and they had rejected it. They had turned away and they would kicked out the presence of God from their hearts. And so they're wondering, will God's presence ever return? And then John chapter 1 happens. John chapter 1, who is the same John who wrote Revelation, writing his gospel about Jesus, says these words, that the word, the word that made all things, the word that has always been, the word that is God, this word became flesh and dwelt among us. The same exact word that John uses in Revelation 21. This word became flesh. Eugene Peterson says that the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. In Jesus, this word of God, God came so intimately close to his creation that he took it on himself. He he breathed our air. He lived our lives. He suffered the things we suffered with. But more than that, he died our death. And he took our sin on him. But then he rose victoriously to show you that nothing can ever separate you from God. But he went one step further, and when he told his disciples before he ascended to heaven, he breathed on them, he said, I'm giving you my Holy Spirit. And he says the same thing to you. If you have faith in him, if you've been washed in the waters of of baptism in the name of our God, you have the Holy Spirit living in you right now. And the New Testament tells us that anyone who has the Holy Spirit, you are the temple of God. 
You are the temple of God. The temple of God is not this building. It's not a place. It's a people. And God promises to be with his people. And you have that promise right now. Because God's longing is to be present with you and me and all of us. And that's amazing and incredible. But it's only going to get better. Because there's a day coming where you will see him face to face where you will see your Savior Jesus who has lived for you, who has died for you, who has risen for you, who has given you his spirit, his forgiveness, his mercy, you will get to see him right in front of you. You'll get to look at his hands and see the marks where he took the nails for you. You'll get to see his, his body breathing and living to see that that he really is alive and he has conquered death and he's conquered your sin and your death. You're going to see it. And you're going to get to experience that presence forever. And when we're in that presence of God, when he returns and makes all things new, this is what he promises in verse 4, that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain for the former things have passed away. There's going to be no more crying, no more death, no more loss, no more sadness, because we're in the presence of God in this incredible way. We long to be at home, and God promises to bring it. God longs to be present with us, and he is present with us now, and he promises to be at present with us in a greater way when he returns. But I mentioned there's one command. One command in Revelation 21, and it's this. Behold. We don't use that word in everyday language, but, but the scripture uses it all the time. Here's the command. Behold. Specifically, if you hear this word from Revelation 25, 21 verse 5, behold, I am making all things new. The one command we're given, behold. In other words, it's this. Let God do his God thing and watch what he does. Be on the lookout, even now, for how God is bringing his new world into this world. Be on the lookout for how he is, he is bringing healing and mercy and justice into your life. Be on the lookout for it. Behold it. Watch for it. Fix your eyes on it because it's a promise that God will be faithful. Because here's the thing, there's nothing you and I can do to mess this up. I don't know if you knew that. Jesus bringing in this new world doesn't depend on how good you and I are. He's going to do it. He simply asks us to watch him and to behold his beauty and majesty now, that isn't to say that this beholding is meaning that we don't do anything and we're completely passive. Because here's what I know. When we behold something so beautiful and transcendent and so miraculous, it changes us. It transforms you. When you behold this promise and this work of God in bringing his new creation, even now but in full when he returns, what you see is that that as you behold the forgiveness of Christ for you, and you behold it, and you look at it, and you receive it, and you let it get into your heart and mind, guess what happens to you? He makes you into a, a maybe slightly more forgiving person. Maybe we still struggle with it, but he makes you into a more forgiving person. As we behold the incredible generosity of Christ, that he has given us all things now, but he promises even more things when he returns that are unending, this incredible generosity. As we behold that and watch that, maybe it makes us a little bit more generous of people to others around us. When we see the sacrifice and we behold what Christ has done for us by going to the greatest possible length to sacrifice for us, and we see that God did that for you and me, it makes us people willing to sacrifice for others, willing to give even when it hurts to meet the needs of others. 
as you behold him and his goodness and how he's making all things new, it changes you. It makes you into a different type of person that shows people that God is making all things new. And he's starting with us. So friends, as we close the book of Revelation, my hope and prayer is this, for as confusing as Revelation can be, as scary as it can be sometimes, here's my hope, that you would find comfort in these words. Because Christ sees you, sees you in your pain and your hardships and your suffering. He sees it, and he's doing something about it. And he's bringing us this new home that we all long for. So as we await that day, may we be people who behold him, who look at him, and let him transform us now. Amen. One of the things that we as people of faith do as we behold his work and behold what he has done for us is we confess our faith. Uh, we proclaim that to one another and to the world. Uh, one of the ways that the church has done that is through uh, a few different uh, creeds, and one of those that we'll speak today is known as the Apostles' Creed. I invite you all to please stand with me as we join together with Christians around the world and across time to confess the faith that we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You all may be seated. And as we continue now, we take time to come before our Heavenly Father in a time of prayer. Dear good and gracious Lord, we give you thanks for our time of worship this morning. Uh, this time where we uh, come and behold you and your goodness and mercy and your love. Lord, as we reflect upon and receive the mercy of Jesus Christ for us, may you transform us by the power of your Holy Spirit uh, to be more and more in the image of Jesus Christ that we may show people this inbreaking of your new world, that we may be a foretaste of the world that is to come through what we say and do and believe. Lord, we also want to pray uh, this morning for our church leaders uh, here at Peace, uh, our elected leaders, our directors, and our elders. Uh, we give you thanks for, for these lay leaders and the, the passion you've given to them and the heart of, uh, of servants that you've get put on them. And Lord, we also thank you for our number of our, uh, a number of other leaders here in our church that, that lead our ministries and, and support one another, all for the glory of your name uh, and for the building up of one another in faith. Lord, we pray for all of the, the community partnerships we have with uh, local organizations uh, here around us, but also organizations around the world. Uh, we pray for them and our continued partnership uh, that we may serve them uh, and join, in, join with them in blessing our neighborhoods and communities. Lord, we also want to pray and lift up a number of people from our families and our church that need your healing and gracious uh, hand and presence in their lives. Specifically this morning, we pray for Ellie. Nancy, Sarah, Sarah, Devon, Gary, Jim, Jane, John, Jeremy, Mary, David, Karen, Debbie, Greg, Pauline, John, Melanie, Marty, Amy, Will, and Michelle, and the many other people on our hearts and minds, Lord, we lift them up to you. We ask for you to be with them and to be with us and bring your care, comfort, and your healing into our lives. All of this we pray uh, with boldness and confidence as we join together and pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord promises that when he returns, he will make all things new, bring us a new home. Uh, What we have uh, in this meal, this Lord's Supper, is a foretaste of that new creation, of that hope that we long for and we look forward to. On the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, blessed it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you in the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In just a moment, we'll have our usher come forward and and dismiss you to come forward to receive the Lord's Supper. We'll start at this side of the congregation uh, with the front row and working ourselves back, and then we'll switch over to this side of the congregation. You're invited to come forward and receive uh, the the bread and the wine from me and one of our elders. If you would like to come forward and receive uh, simply a blessing, simply cross your arms and you'll receive a blessing as you come forward for communion. The table of the Lord is open, and I'll invite our elder to come forward at this time.
Holy Father, Son, and Spirit, Holy Communion, free in one. Holy Father, Son, and Spirit, Holy Communion, free in one. Father, Son, and Spirit, three in one. Holy Father, Son, and Spirit, three in one. Mitchell, please rise. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in the one true faith, now and forever. Amen. Receive the blessing from our Heavenly Father as he blesses us and sends us out to be a blessing to others. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. I believe in the sun I believe in the risen one I believe I overcome By the power of His blood I was dead.